Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. Today, we're diving deep into something you probably never think about, but is insanely crucial. Your cranial nerves. These things are like the unsung heroes of your body, playing a massive role in your overall health and wellness. We're going to talk about how these nerves impact everything you do, from blinking to breathing, and why they don't get the attention they deserve. I've seen some wild stuff in my practice related to cranial nerve issues, and it's mind-blowing how these tiny little nerves can wreak havoc on your health. So, why are we overlooking these power players in our bodies? Buckle up. It's going to be a fascinating ride. Welcome to the show, Dr. Lois Laney. I am looking forward to our conversation, especially in looking in our in your background and so much information that will help each person and not just the lay person, but the doctors as well. Uh, I do have to mention one funny thing that uh, autocorrect keeps changing your last name to Lois Lane instead of Laney. And I'm sure you've heard this a thousand times before, but <laughs> I always had a crush on Lois Lane as as Superman's uh, you know sidekick yeah. there. So I thought it was a cute, and it should know me by now. Yeah. Clearly, it does. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're happy to have you, uh, and uh, we look forward to this journey during our conversation. So I'm going to start with asking about. Um, Tell us about the restorative breathing method that seems to be something you've developed and uh, that you are most excited about. Oh, my pleasure. Well, thank you for having me on first so we can share with everyone listening. Cranial nerves are the most overlooked powerhouse that you have. It creates life. It diminishes life. Your quality of being human rests in the, the circuitry of your cranial nerves. They make up part of your brainstem, not all of it, but part of it. And the quality and the synchronicity of this wiring system is the essential part. So when we restore breathing, because, you know, 30 years ago, people were like, breathing? Well, of course I'm breathing. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be dead. I'm like, well, you know that asthma? Uh, you know the high blood pressure? Uh, you know the acid reflux? You know, the snoring, all of that is because cranial nerves are out of sync. Now they tell the brain what to do. They tell the body what to do. It's the highway between the brain and body. Just a little bit important. <laughs> but as you go around, you realize that like, you know, after 1975, like nobody talks about them anymore. I'm like, oh, they're my best friends. How dare we not pay attention to them? So restoring breathing is restoring autonomic breathing, okay? It is a non-conscious event. Now we can consciously practice a style, but what are you doing when you're not focusing on it? That's your autonomic nervous system. So all 12 cranial nerves, right and left side, have to be all in sync. They have to be synchronized and they have to equally stimulate the brain so that the brain tells the body what to do and the body stimulates the brain. Is that good enough? So far, so good. So what makes what we, you know, traditional breathing different than your approach? Well, put it this way. I test cranial nerves, and that's what I have developed for every single fiber. So as you know, my first demo, my favorite one, is a nerve. And each one of these nerves have all these fibers. So the way I explain it now is I use straws and I go, so we have fiber optics and they have to carry electricity. So if your hot nerve isn't working or your hot fiber, excuse me, your cold fiber, your vibrational fiber, my touch fiber, how about my smell fiber, my taste fiber, my sight, all those fibers go to different parts of the brain and stimulate it. And if the brain isn't stimulated to the cranial nerve system, then the brain doesn't know how much electricity it needs to send for the muscles to work. The implication, the face isn't going to grow the same. The biggest implication is your airway isn't going to grow the same. So if it doesn't have natural stimulation, it doesn't develop. Your brain doesn't develop fully. 
your facial structures don't develop fully. And the part that we don't see behind our face is our airway system. So when we look at measuring all those cranial nerves, every little fiber, is it accurate? Okay. When it's not accurate, the implication is you can't continuously breathe at an optimal electrical level as well as an optimal biochemical level. So now you have disease and the snowball mm. of dysfunction starts, but it's silent, but you have to measure it. You can't tell a person, oh yeah, I think cranial nerve seven and five, ooh, that eight is really out of sync today. No, you have to measure. How do you measure? And if a patient walked into you, uh, what would be the way you would start that protocol? Oh, this is the best question. My favorite <laughs> tool is a Q-tip. We're going to just touch those little nerves with a Q-tip, you know, see if they feel and if they know even where they are. So the concept, of course, I have a diagram here. We are measuring... If I touch your face, the good old homunculus. Oh, homunculus. Yeah. Okay, so if the homunculus is misrepresented in the brain, the body is following the wrong map. The closest thing we know is GPS. When it first came out, did you drive and the, you're, you know, you traveling, you're going to a hotel and your GPS says you have arrived and you're in a cornfield. Clearly you have the wrong map. Okay, <laughs> so our bodies are just the same. Okay, our bodies aren't working, and chiropractic understands this completely because there's a what obstacle, the wires aren't connected, electricity isn't getting through, the pathways are obstructive in some dimension. But if we start with cranial nerves first, sometimes if they're left behind, the spine doesn't get to do everything because the brainstem isn't on board fully or incompletely, or mm. the right side's more dominant than left. The biggest influence are motor vehicle accidents. That mm. invisible trauma, we know now within six hours of a motor vehicle situation, guess what's going to happen? Leaky gut starts. Why? The electricity on your vagus nerve has been compromised. We can't hold the integrity of the one cell thick layer of your intestines. The dominoes of dysfunction are occurring. You can have it full blown in 45 days. So if we don't measure cranial nerve function, you're going to have altered sleep. You're going to have altered oxygenation. You're going to have altered, you know, frontal lobe act activity in the brain. Well, now that's going to be what? Your discrimination. So people know the person who hasn't recovered. And if you trace it back, it's when everything was fine. Yeah, because right. you look good. You know, it's just mm -hmm. like the MD. Oh, do we just look at the person and say, oh, I think all your reflexes are intact. No. Mm -hmm. What do we do? We measure. So my mm -hmm. mission is to make sure everybody reconnects with a very traditional cranial nerve assessment. Now, I put mm -hmm. it in the order of what I believe the most accurate way to obtain data. What does that mean? Do we, who overrides who? Does the sensory system override the muscle system or does the muscle system override the sensory system? So my background is neurophysiology. So I look at it as who has the most voltage and who overrides what? Because I can't test cranial nerve five because it's the biggest nerve and it draws the most power. So if I amp up five by testing it, it's going to not let the other smaller electrical draw nerves be accurate. So if I do the little, the little nerves kind of first, then I find out data, and then I go to the bigger nerves last. And now I find how each fiber is, is just what is, what is the lay of the land, so to speak. So what do you start with? Which nerve is I start with most... cranial nerve 12. Then I go to 11 because they're pure motor and they tell me what I'm truly looking for is a Chiari because a Chiari will totally limit 
all of our abilities and we just chase round and round. So if you have problems with cranial nerve 12, left and right, cranial nerve 11, left and right, cranial nerve 10, left and right. Now we want, that's what I want Kairos to do is start doing what? A stand up MRI. Why? And wait. We can see how much of that brainstem has been tugged out of our skull. Mm -hmm. And then when that is resolved, you have freed that person of being trapped in a vicious cycle of dysfunction. You know, the medical mm -hmm. community wants to change what? Put you in surgery and we're going to dr drill a bigger hole. Okay. Well, you know, if you believe in SOT kind of chiropractors where we can you know, angle things, take the pressure, take the pressure, take the pressure off, start firing. What a concept. Reestablish equilibrium. What could that look like? We could see them every day for a week <laughs> just to keep the pressure off. You maybe give them a stroller belt. I mean, let's keep the pressure off. And oh my <laughs> gosh, the body could heal. You know, so it's it's after I'm after the Chiari and cranial nerve 11 is a big one because what? It's half cranial, half spinal, cervical, right? So if 11, I when I teach cranial nerve 11, I wear a lifesaver or life jacket, you know, the big one, the oh, orange one okay. that's got me by the neck, right. you know, and I walk the whole time <laughs> talking all about so they'll never forget it because everybody forgets 11. I, I don't know why. I go, but if 11 is locked on, it's your brainstem has the perception you are going to die. Now, what are you dying from? I don't know. Was it the shock of the bank account or was it the shock of the car accident that didn't happen? I don't know. But the jerk of that quick stop, that's just as damaging to your brainstem as the humongous impact. You know, yes, and right. good old airbags. Oh, they saved your life. Oh. You're right. And you smush your phrenic nerve and cranial 11 comes on and poor Vegas just got dumped. You know, the whole thing mm -hmm. of keeping you alive, regulating your oxygen, out the door. Mm -hmm. You know, but we don't measure oxygen because <laughs> it's really not vital. Really? Really. Hmm. How much research have we had? And I said, well, we can't find that double blind study. Because nobody's volunteered to not breathe. And then we can have the <laughs> real study with oh the equal, gosh. you know. No, there's some things we cannot kill you while, while we study you. So, <laughs> yeah, this comes back to, but see, this is the fun part. We know we have something that's not working, and then we measure. Now, not, not here to put you on the spot in any way, but when people measure oxygen... Think about reflexes. Do you just measure one side? Oh, we're going to put it on our finger, and now we know the state of your body. No! Do you think the oxygen could be different? Do you think the blood flow could be different, my right side and left side? If you as a doctor now know, I'm 92 and I'm 98, where are you going to look next? Hmm, my left shoulder. Something is pin is limiting my blood flow and oxygenation. If I don't measure, I don't know. So the measurements just give you a clear map of where I can't function, but it's not telling my brain. So my brain doesn't know darn what to do about it. I don't know I have a problem because I can't receive the data. So this whole concept of what's your chief complaint Oh, no. Long time ago, first thing they did was what? Shake your hand. Do you know why you're shaking the patient's hand? How's the temperature? Clammy? Cold? Hmm. You know, you look in their mouth. What'd you say? Have them say. Ah, what do you think they looking in your throat? We're checking out cranial nerve 11 and 10 and 9. Why? Because they keep you alive. Hmm. And they help you sleep which is where you heal. Hmm. So if you have happy 11, 12, 10, 9, you don't snore. You don't even make noise when you breathe. 
But don't worry, we have 17,000 appliances we can do for you now. We're going to do something. <laughs> Heaven forbid we just turn so the you, nerve back on with the Q-tip. You were testing for oxygen and you differentiated one side from the other. How are you pulse ox. measuring? Pulse ox, and it depends your pulse ox. You know, the $12 one is quite not so good as the $400 or $500 one. But okay. Joel, I'll shock you. We even measure your toes. Wouldn't it be mm -hmm. great to know how the toes are doing? Hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. Why do we care? Why do we care so much about blood flow in the toes? Back to our map. Right mm -hmm. here's where our feet are. Okay. So what happens in our hemispheres when we have a whiplash that is visually non-detectable, that there's any injury, right? It always does what? Who gets smushed in the middle of my right and left hemisphere? My arteries. I've had diminished blood flow to my brain, so my brain can't send. I could have what? Problem with my spine. Of course I'm going to have something with my lumbar spine. Why? Because of the seatbelt. So yes, they, they, they support X, but they also cause Y. So let's check both. Let's do something very traditional. Back when we had lights and tongue depressors and Q-tips. And, and <laughs> let's turn these puppies back on. Because that's the force of life. Yeah. And that's what we're restoring when we restore breathing. It is your life force from your cranial nerves. Now, there's other dimensions. But that's, that's the electrical circuit I work with first. And then when you, so based on your evaluation and how you're going to manage a patient, but you start by testing the smallest or uh, of the cranial nerves and then move to the, right. so I do the, motor the ones that are first. most robust. Right. So which one, wh how, what would your protocol be? I'm just curious. Well, my protocol is a little detailed. <laughs> Oh, and wait nice. a minute, let's see. Okay. It goes all the way up and it goes all the way down. So here's the one thing, not to put you on the spot, but just curious. Mm -hmm. So when you check a cranial nerve, let's say 12, you're supposed to stick your tongue out, right? Yes. Okay. Do you think if they cross their knees, it could affect my, the results? Yes. Of course. Yes. And you think if the feet were off the floor, it could affect it? Or if the feet were on the floor, you could get maybe more raw organic data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, here's yes. the ultimate test. Is it with eyes open? We do both. Right. But if I just want to correct, examine a cranial nerve, the eyes can't be open. Yes. Right. So that. Won't but we live with our eyes open most of the time. So it's always good to do both but, tests. But you're still not doing it because you've activated the other part of the brain. Yeah. Understood. Right. And then like my it. cerebellum's on board. Yeah. I don't want to mm -hmm. test my cerebellum. I just want to test my cranial nerves. Because if they can't do that job, I'm going to sound like this at night. <laughs> you know. There we go. Mm -hmm. Off and running. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the number one thing. If you look all over the internet, everybody has their eyes open because people are not looking at one fiber at a time. And that's mm -hmm. the biggest difference. You are not going to find it. Okay? So I don't know how many of you have gone to court to present your case for an injury. And usually... There's a doctor of sorts that says cranial nerve two through twelve is what? Grossly intact. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So now the team of the Academy of Motor Vehicle Injuries and American Functional Neurology groups, they get to say, could you demonstrate how you obtain that? Could you demonstrate that? Well, you know, I had them do this and this and this. Well, then they bring up their, I think it's called an IME exam. And mm -hmm. 
that didn't occur during the assessment prior to going to court. Mm -hmm. So we've made some inroads and the awards are slightly different when we ask one to demonstrate how they were aware of the cranial nerves. Because technically, I know court is kind of technical, but it's a lie. It's a fabricated information. Well, that's what we normally do. Well, it's still not legal. It's not accurate. Because if a patient can't swallow properly, because let's suppose a hyoid got boinged just a little bit, you're going to have what? You're not going to sleep. You're going to have acid reflux. You're going to snore. You're not going to absorb your food. You're going to have, a, it, it, you're, you can't what? Heal. Right? Yeah. Interesting. You know, we were always taught in school that sometimes with swallowing, it's oftentimes a uh, initial condition after a whiplash or in football, you know, getting your head knocked around because that anterior longitudinal ligament is always under, is always taut. And when you're straining that, it swells and that would cause uh, difficulty with swallowing, it's usually dissipated. But I, I like the approach you're coming off with. Well, if you do cranial nerves and you activate them. We don't pay attention to the cranial yeah, so nerves Yeah, so we have often. a women's soccer team, and everybody on there can master cranial nerves. So they take this, as soon as you get hit in the head, take them off field, check their cranial nerves, reactivate the cranial nerves. When their CO2 resets, they can go back out. It's that quick. You know why? Because cranial nerves fire 100 million billion times a millisecond. That's why I tell people, chop, chop, let's get going. Okay, that's to the end of the universe and back. Little Q-tip, yeah. know what to do, touch the nerve at the right sensory receptor, off you go. You know, it's just like reflexes. You know, if you doing at the bottom of the patella, you may not get the reflex. You have to doing at the right point <laughs> to get the result. It's just like cranial nerves. People are like, well, I touched my tongue. Yeah, but in the wrong spot. You know, the doorbell, you got to push it the right. You can appreciate all that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. But cranial nerve 11 Other cranial always nerve comes on to that, that posterior airway to support it. And then you turn into chest breathers. Why? Because it's your spinal accessory. You're on your accessory batter power. So when you go like this, <laughs> of course, I'm exaggerating. But when you move your shoulders to breathe, is that going to allow REM sleep? No! Your diaphragm has to do this because you're going to be paralyzed, right? So to go into REM sleep, mm -hmm. your shoulders can't work. So 11 cannot be your breather. We're on your backup accessory power. Then you fatigue. Your adrenals go, oh, we have adrenal fatigue. Oh, we have this and this. No, you have cranial nerve dysfunction first. Get Now, do you still need adrenal support? Of course, but we got to get the electricity back down to the organ so the organ can do its little job. Then you live happily. Out of curiosity, how would you test olfactory? Well, that's a great question. So it's sensory. Do you think the eyes are open or closed? Well, based on what you had mentioned before, closed. Yes, you get the bonus point. So during <laughs> everything except moving your eyes, your eyes. eyes have to be closed. Now, if a nervous system has been altered, we're going to call it altered, not injured. The first thing, and you guys know this, first thing that's going to happen is they're always going to cross their legs. So I have to look at the whole human. I have to make sure their feet are on the floor, their legs don't go cross, their arms don't cross, and they keep their eyes closed. So I have developed a verbiage to where the nervous system is not put on edge because they're injured. So an injured brain is in self-preservation. So, and you all know, we, we have to be gentle, respectful, and at the same time, get the job done. Hmm. 
go. So would you have them check their sense of oh, smell course. with uh, coffee beans or anything in particular with their no. eyes closed? How are you checking I, olfactory? If, if, you, if you look at the literature, coffee was designed because it was common in the United States. Okay. That's not relevant. That's not a true neurological test. That's a cultural thing that was quick. Okay. So in a neurological exam, most of the time say, can you smell your food? And a person says yes, but they really don't smell their food. They see their food and they remember what it smells like. So this is right. Notice mm. what happens is people bring, you're supposed to be four inches away. So and it's the one thing I don't have as a demo. Darn. I love my background in dentistry because dentistry has all these little tools that we can use. So if you just stick a cotton roll up the nose, I've blocked one nostril. See how I can isolate? So quick. And then you hold it there and you have, you have to instruct them to breathe in. Because in this exam, almost all the time, their, their nervous system is so out of sync for breathing that with their eyes closed, they're scrambling because also, of course, the cerebellum is a little bit tweaked. But they're using a whole bunch of energy for this test, right? This isolation, because the compensation is huge. So as soon as you close their eyes, they're going to isolate. So yeah, I bring up things like, you know, garlic is a universal smell. Okay, but we start with something like vanilla, something like lemons, something like orange, you know, but here's the fun part. How many times are you going to test these people? So you have to have set one, then you have to have set two, and you have to have about six different sets of smells. So you can't do lemon on the right side and orange on the left side because smell goes to your brain. It goes straight to your limbic system. Okay, so you have to be careful what you're having them smell because you don't want them to go into another dimension. You want them to stay in the present moment. So you have to have something universal. Vanilla is very vanilla. <laughs> um, it's an easy thing. Most everybody knows what vanilla smells like. You know, vanilla ice cream is pretty darn common. Vanilla creamer is pretty darn common. So you, you do things like that. So you may have vanilla and then you may have garlic. Do you see? I mean, two very different mm. smells. And almost all the time, they can't smell. And mm -hmm. this is way before COVID. Because they have tracked down. Yeah. And it's universal mm. awareness that the beginning of Parkinson's, the beginning of dementia, is loss of smell. Now, isn't that interesting? Because, of course, we have to tie it to mm. something and come up with a drug. However, if you go back the implications of lack of smell is your limbic system is massively, it can't interpret things properly. So of course it's going to affect mm. your memory. Of course it's going to affect the synchronization. So just imagine if your right hemisphere is being activated through smell by your right nostril, but your left nostril is offline. Wow, talk about asymmetrical, hemispherical dimension. Mm. Okay, so now you go to sleep, you can smell half the time, and you can't smell the other time because smell never changes because you're supposed to what? Smell danger when you go to sleep. That's what makes you safe mm. to go into this state of being paralyzed. Okay, so if I can't mm. smell when my brain goes to the different hemispheres to breathe through my nose, how do you say screwed up mm. nicely? Hmm, you got, you've got a neurological situation. So when you isolate that, I'm sure you're totally aware of it. There's a dollar amount behind that puppy. Mm. Now, there's only mm -hmm. like one or two MRIs in the country that can go find that there is no cranial nerve number one. You know, it's been smushed beyond recognition. Mm. But, you know, you can do that test. Now, that whatever happens when you close your eyes and you bring it four inches away, so you have to practice how far is four inches because a lot of people don't know. 
that's very exciting because they want to stick it right here. No, you have to cue them to breathe in, but their head almost always drops. Okay, so as a chiropractor, what's going on when their head drops, when their eyes are closed? A lot's going on. How about we just say that? See, you know that because you can see they can't even smell with their eyes closed and they can't even retain posture of their head. So if that happens, what's happening to their poor airway? Mm. That's why then, mm. what, you're going to go in there and you're going to make 11 happy and 10 happy and 9 happy. <laughs> and then you live happily ever after and you change a person's life. Mm. We've been hearing uh, in the in, oh, YouTube videos, uh, patients, friends of mine talk about doctors that are are even medical doctors are working exclusively with the vagus nerve and how it can have profound effects on all the others. Can you comment well, on that? Well, it's the sexiest now? nerve right now. Thank goodness somebody's yeah, paying yeah. attention <laughs> to a cranial nerve. You know, yeah, before, one, like one about 15 years ago, yeah. people didn't even know that cranial nerves were in your brainstem. Like, right. okie dokie, where do we think they live? You know, oh, we never thought of it. Okay, perfect. But they do know mm -hmm. the acronyms and they know the cute little rhymes, but they don't know anything right. about them. Yeah. yeah. So think of it as, I just tell people, you have a Ferris wheel and there's, there really are 24 buckets on this Ferris wheel. Okay, because the right and left side are valid. They're independent. They really are. And all of them have to work together. And it's a domino effect. So there truly is the potentiation cascade. So if one in, if both sides of run are working, they're firing the brain equally. Oh, that's a good day. If two isn't working equally, what's it going to affect? Your cerebellum. Now your cerebellum, oh, your cerebellum now can't coordinate you, okay? So now, and it also is your fuel powerhouse. So if I can't coordinate and I fatigue, again, I'm not going to recover, right? So you look at all the things. All of them have to work together. You don't get your vagus until you get the domino effect, or it's really, think of it as a cascade. Okay, so you go all the way up, you're first from a sequential anatomical event. Cranial nerve three has a parasympathetic. Okay, do you activate that? Well, if you don't activate that, do you think you're going to get Vegas? The answer is no. Or if you get it, you may not keep it longer than an hour. Why? You don't have the autonomics behind you. Right? You can get change, but you can't keep change. So you've got to go and go back. Why are they light sensitive? Because cranial nerve three, it's parasympathetic dimensions offline. So of course we go through back doors, right? Isn't that what Cairo's about? That's the way Cairo thinks and the way I think is very similar. I'm it's like, oh, the parietal's not working. Oh, no worry. I can go through this door. You know, I'm going to activate the hands that's going to activate the area by the tongue. We're going to, we're going to get it that way or help the brain to stimulate until everything else comes back online. So you've got to have three, you've got to have seven, you've got to have nine in order to get 10, but you don't get 10 if 11 is locked on. Okay. Mm. Cause there's no place for the electricity to go, so to speak. Of mm -hmm. course you get some, but you don't get your full potential. You don't get enough mm -hmm. to keep the stuff going. And not only that, it's called processing. So turning on a light doesn't mean I know how to get through my house. I just have lights on in one room. I have to have the lights on available in all rooms and I have to know where the circuit is. So it's what? It's an automated continuous cycle. Do we all need support at different times? Of course we do. But yes, the vagus nerve is really exciting. And then people are like, well, we're going to do this and this and this. I go, is it a motor nerve? Is it a sensory nerve? What, what are we doing? Are we motorizing vagus or are we sensitizing vagus? <laughs> you know, and there's different parts, of course. But what's amazing is when you sit back and you look at the system and you start activating the cranial nerves and you will absolutely see the belly just turn on natural. 
Mm-hmm. Now mm-hmm. we have autonomic homeostasis. Isn't that the place? Mm-hmm. Now go back and check, because guess what? Your range of motion is going to be bigger. Why? Because your brain can open your airway without thinking about it. You know? So when you think of airway, mm. everybody thinks about what? This is your airway. But no, you got to open the nose. Mm-hmm. The right nostril has to open. The left nostril has to open. If the nostrils don't move, you're not in an autonomic state. So you got to have everybody on the same team. And going toward the same goal. <laughs> You were going to say. So you talk about resetting, yep. resetting, and that's something that people could do at home once they figure out what's wrong. Or you just or keep. You going. would help, obviously, facilitate. How is someone to reset? Well, after you have a base, I, I tell people that you really should have a baseline. Okay. But until you get a baseline, you can still no. activate your own cranial nerves. Now, you have to have somebody guide you through it, through it because mm-hmm. the oxygen levels matter. And in my world, what matters the most is the CO2 level. And that's when you exhale. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that is can my body mm-hmm. sense and interpret and self-regulate the biochemistry of my breathing? So your CO2 level is what you want to establish first. So when a CO2 gets reestablished, now you open the door to neuroplasticity. Now, if you have a patient... I have a... Oh, uh, go ahead. Well, mm-hmm. what I was going to say is... No, no, no. I was just... I, I was. Well, ahead. if you have a patient who's never been in a car accident, those people are a piece of cake. If you had a baby who mm-hmm. didn't have the cord around the neck, never had a surgery, never had a car accident, they're a piece of cake. Those are the patients we've had, those people that are mm-hmm. tougher than nails. They don't have that scar tissue. Mm-hmm. Somebody hasn't altered their breathing. So part of the anesthesiologist a long time ago, they never reset the CO2 above 35. Well, that's a bad day. That's Mm. irresponsible. So, of course, I visited this association and their conventions. and It's now something they remeasure at the end and bring them to a reset position. Because if you leave me at 30 30 exhalation CO2, guess who gets the number one thing that's not working? My frontal lobe. Oh, that's a good day. So you got to get it to where you have vasodilation, okay? And that's what the CO2 does. And that's not cranial nerve 10. That's a different cranial nerve. So you got to have the CO2. Mm. CO2 is your what? Spark of life. It's your effervescence. It's your bubbliness. You're going to create vasodilation so now the brain can get more blood, which means I can deliver more oxygen, Right? So that's the process. So car accidents alter that. Baby's born with a cord around the neck or a near drowning. If you have a near drowning, that nervous system is locked in in a significant shock state. Mm. But if you don't have those people, you tweak them. You go out the door. You don't see them until they know they have a problem because their nervous system is really wired at a much higher level or efficient level, I should say. So you mentioned earlier about you would need a facilitator for someone to test on their own. I mean, testing on your own would be a little more complicated, I would imagine, to get it accurately, uh, get accurate feedback. But how about, uh, you know, testing and retesting if any of our listeners were interested in trying to determine what was going on and how they can help themselves? Any suggestions on that? Well, if it's down and dirty, because, of course, People kind of want that. Mm-hmm. The big question, well, I have to educate you about one more thing first. So cranial nerve number five is your biggest voltage nerve. Okay? That's your trigeminal. Yeah. It goes to everything. Mm-hmm. Now, it has so much voltage that it can overpower, right? We know it can overpower and it can mm-hmm. 
pull the electricity from other nerves. Because we know you have enough power in your masseter muscles that you can bite a finger off. You know, we know that in dentistry. Mm -hmm. I have all my fingertips. Mm -hmm. So what we do, I know, it's like we got to be on top of it. If your teeth don't touch, okay? So when teeth don't touch, and I mean enamel to enamel, you take away that draw. So now you have equalization and you have conveniently opened your airway slightly. What a concept. Now for that, mm -hmm. you have to have another tool, a popsicle stick. And you can put the popsicle <laughs> stick between your teeth. Now, you want it on the front teeth. And the reason why you want it on the front teeth is there's a reflex that has to do with neural development. Babies get their front teeth first, but it helps to change the tension on our crabby nerve, cranial nerve 11. We don't want it to be too crabby. So where's my other little thing? Now, should you not have the amazing, oh darn, maybe I don't have it. If you don't have this popsicle stick, you could go back to a Q-tip and put that between your teeth. So some people, because of the shape of their teeth, they would prefer to have a little Q-tip. You can use that or the popsicle stick. So here's the dance. You're smiling. You like this, don't you? I do. If you well. do this, now you can start to test other nerves and see if the bully is in neutral, does the electricity also work? So why is that relevant? Well, in the Academy, American Academy of Motor Vehicle Injuries, you know, they have up there all the research, and it's amazing, don't get me wrong. All those research have the dummies, and each dummy costs like $200,000. All those little sensors, you know, every car accident from the side at 20 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour, whatever, all that stuff so they can reconstruct it. So I went to there and I said, you know, I'm a purist, and that's not accurate. Well, you know who didn't like to hear that? I go, your dummy doesn't have a jaw. <laughs> because when your head goes, so does this jaw. And then you get a pissed off cranial nerve number five. Because everyone's like, oh, TMJ, even now, TMJ, oh, it, it's in your head. Right, it's in your skull. Mm-hmm. Why? It's a nerve. What's the problem? The biggest nerve in the world. There's sympathetic chains. It activates mm -hmm. that nucleus. It activates what? Your entire spinal column. Woo! Don't you think it affects chiropractic? So guess what? We got to neutralize the bully. Hmm. Now if we do this, now the question is, can you sit and breathe for three minutes holding this between your nose. And when you do, your body can reset to its best ability or its highest potential at that moment. Now you can go in there and check cranial nerves all over. You can now, let's, let's go to the traditional, um, traditional doctor visit. They have a little tongue depressor. See, this is another mm -hmm. tool. It's a little bigger. So if you like bigger, but, you know, this one really is quite well. What do they do with this? They hold your tongue down. Why? To see your throat. Why? Because when you say, ah, your throat should do what? It should open. Now, it's a 360 open. degree tube. It should open in a 360 fashion. Not like one part moves, other. See, that's the damage of a whiplash. Darn. Okay. So now when you say, ah, you have this little uvula, your uvula should uvulize. Mm -hmm. It should wiggle. <laughs> okay. I say it should look like a bell, wiggle like a bell. <laughs> Most importantly, it should retract like a blind. Then the soft palate should lift. So if you ever check out mm -hmm. kind of the stuff I talk about, neurosequencing. See, that's the sequence of the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve has to open my throat first. Does it do it alone? No. 
it has some friends. It has cranial nerve 9 and it's cranial nerve 10. Cranial nerve 12 has to hang in there. Okay, so 9, 10, and 11 have to be in unison and in synchronization, and I have to have equal electricity from my right side and my left side for this tube to open. I should wiggle, lift, and then the soft palate lift. When that happens, here's the problem. Well, let me see if I'm lined up right. So what happens is this part here has to open like this. But if this soft palate is lifting and cranial nerve 11 has locked this and my OA is out of alignment, I can't lift the soft palate or I'm going to what? Choke. Choke. Mm. Huh. I'm also going to snore. So we got to get the openers working first. The wiggler's working second. The lifter's moving first. And guess where we start? This is a test question. Get ready. Do we start on the motor nerve or do we start on the sensory nerve? The sensory, sensory. you say. Exactly. So what's the sensory system of cranial nerve 10? Do we know? Well, we have to touch it. Hang on. Where's my little, where's my demo? Oh, boogers. Here we go. Well, on my little fibers, <laughs> right? We have to stroke it. We have to hold it. We have to hot it. We have to cold it. We have to vibrate it. Yeah. And then what's what taste bud on the tongue turns on cranial nerve number 10? Vinegar, you say. Exactly. So if your eyes wow. see, and this is this is what people do. They have a can of vinegar or a bottle of vinegar. They bring it to the patient and then they touch their mouth. What do you think the patient's going to think is touching them? Maybe they can read and see that it's vinegar, right? Yeah. So if you <laughs> sneakily hide that and their eyes are closed and you dab it in there, I have to now touch the tongue, my very friendly tongue. Where are my taste buds for vinegar? They're not here. Um, I have to be able to touch back here. Now, on the, the second top? part is they're going to say, oh, it's hard to see back there. Yeah, you got to get a flashlight. It's really excited. Peek in there. And if I'm above looking down, I can't really see. But if I'm below looking up, I have a great viewplane. So see, position matters. You're smiling. You're mm -hmm. having good fun time in there. So if I get back yeah. in there and I touch, do you know what actually happened? The throat opens. It's like I push the doorbell. The doorbell rings. Yeah, it's called electricity. <laughs> now, you have to know the placement. You got to get finesse. You got to get really good because, see, there's this long Q-tip, the six-incher. That's good. So you get back there and touch, mm -hmm. and half the people, well, not even half, I bet 15% of all the testing they can identify vinegar they can't taste 15 they can't or 50 identify. 15 so all these exercises for the vagus nerve i haven't changed the sensory system i haven't changed the parietal zone for the sensory map i haven't created those connections for continued healing and function we all know see the big the big thing from my point of view is you, you really have 120 days to solve this head injury and you need to get on it. So if you reestablish oxygen mm. regulation, why is that important? Because we want to have plump red blood cells that can carry more. So a red blood, cells, red blood cell lives 120 days. We got to get all the, the new red blood cells to be plump so that they can carry, so they have the proper electricity. So we've got to have all this function going on. Q-tips. Don't forget your popsicle stick. Okay. So you got to practice going back there touching. How do you touch? You say, ah, which is what? A motor program. And then you touch, which is the sensory program. See how you're doing it? Now, you got to get the right side going and you have to do the left side going. Now, 
the best thing I ever learned from the American, what it was it called, Functional Neurology Group or Institute or whatever, is that it takes four sensory events before the target lights up. And everybody stops after one. Now, I'm not talking about an exam or an assessment. I'm talking about the practice you said, what could a person do at home, okay? So if I do one and I gag, oh, well, I have a out of sync nerve. So I'll do two, ah, now I only touch while I'm saying ah, right? Because I have to, I have to get back in this function. I have to touch because food's going to touch my tongue and my throat should open, right? Because otherwise we have what? Aspiration. <gasps> do you know everybody with Parkinson's has aspiration? You know, mm. so they have problems swallowing, smelling, aspiration. It's all cranial nerve function. So we go back in there, we get it. On the fourth time, that side of the throat's going to open. This is great. So guess what we're going to do? We're going to do the other side four times. And then what are we going to do? The most important part, we have to do the midline. We have to innervate, integrate what? The right and left side. And you keep doing that until your friendly throat opens. There is nothing more important in the world than vinegar in your throat with a very long Q-tip and reestablishing that sensory system because that is your lifeline. And then that starts to regulate. And it, the domino effect is pure awesomeness. So if you get the patient after 120 days. Oh, you still do the same thing. I'm just saying that you're just going to have a longer recovery because of the red blood cells because they not, may not be able to carry as much oxygen as they could. So whenever you get somebody, you know, your cranial nerve system is, hasn't fully matured for 120 days. That's what I'm saying. It's okay, ideal so, to start so, right away. Yeah, right. But if you get a patient that's like in a, car accident or a sporting event, you know, rodeo uh, that has a lot of whiplash. Even musicians have a lot of whiplash, cause especially the headbanger's neck and all that. And you get them late. Are you still able to reconnect a lot of their, a lot of their cranial nerves even post 120 days? Yeah. Now, when you do like a cranial nerve assessment, I would do first. And then I would do your chiropractic neurological exam second. I mean, that's what I would do. You can do anything you want. But now you're going to find what else needs to be done. Because you could find that we activate the sensory system. Then mm -hmm. you would go straight into adjusting their neck or adjusting whatever there else is. Because their system has gone longer without optimal firing. So their sleep life mm -hmm. or their sleep quality isn't as good as it could be. But I have people Got who it. they had surgery or they had an accident 10 years earlier. And as a team, it's amazing how fast they can come back online. So you just do your assessments. Oh. You know how many, you know, if it's their 17th car accident, it's going to take a while, right? Right. So, what is the homework you give these patients for resetting? Are you having them dab their tongue with vinegar every day? Or are you having them to do um, exercises? So if the person listening there and they go, I think my cranial nerves are all out of whack and there's not a person that understands. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's, and there's somebody that, that doesn't understand uh, cranial nerves. What can they do on their own that can I help themselves? First, they can look in their mouth and look with the flashlight. Like I said, about can the throat open when they say, ah, okay. They okay. need to really get to know their throat. Now, not stick your tongue out because now you brought cranial nerve 12 on board. Leave the tongue in the mouth, open the throat. And I just tell people mentally open your throat and say, ah, okay. Because they can then, after they do the vinegar, then they can go straight to what? Gargling with cold. Mm. gargling with hot mm. mm -hmm. okay they oh, could, they could there's tons of little toys that you can get back in there to vibrate and we're not you know they could use the back of their electric toothbrush now oh. to wake up a cute to, to wake up 
I, I don't really have a throw to work on. But if you just pretend like my hand's a throat, and if you go back with your electric toothbrush, you just go, ah, uh, one little stroke and out. So if you think of your throat as a clock, you could do like from 12 o'clock to one o'clock, one little ah, uh, and then go from one to two, ah, uh, two to three, ah. Uh. You see, just little tiny strokes. You, Everyone's trying to stay in there for five seconds and then they choke and gag. And then what do they say? It doesn't work. No, it does work. We just have to do it in small increments because it fires 100 million billion times. We just need overlapping strokes. The hardest thing mm -hmm. for people to do is overlapping strokes. So when I have my year training, we have to hmm. practice so on these. So um, I do have a movies. question about. You know, so they can actually uh, practice your... overlapping strokes. <clears throat> to realize how long it takes just to wake up an airway. It, it just take mm. your time, do one cycle at a time, and then you have to go deeper, but that throat will open, it'll open, it'll open, and all of a sudden you'll hear all these digestive sounds. Why? Because now Vegas is vagusizing. You know, it's a cure for what? Constipation. Why? The top of Vegas ain't working. The bottom of Vegas ain't going to work. You know, if the hose isn't on, the water's not coming out at the other end. You just just follow <laughs> the trail of Vegas. So you, you want to do your throat, yeah. little bitty spots. At I have a, I actually have a question, yeah. but I'm not sure if she can, can, can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you. Okay. Now, now we, I probably, we've, we actually probably have tons of questions, but this is a personal question. If someone has been diagnosed with atrial flutter or oh, atrial oh, fibrillation, broke. and obviously that's an electrical issue, <laughs> what, Go ahead. you know, short of doing medications or anything like that, do you have suggestions or do you have, a, would you have a plan on how to take care of something like that? You froze when you asked me what it is. What's going on? That little tiny bit? Atrial flutter or atrial fibrillation? Well, I don't have a medical license to speak to that. Okay? I know electricity. So here's, here's what I still would do. There are very sophisticated heart rate variability. Okay? Um, there seems to be a plethora of this ever since the COVID virus hit the planet. I, I have people who have passed perfectly all their cardiac exams. And now after COVID, and, and you could be on my, it's not about severity of COVID. I mean, people who barely had a cold within 10 days have a flutter or AFib. It is just like crazy. Mm. One of them, my friends is a cardiologist and he talks about this. It's just like everybody has it now. So sometimes ablations create these miracles. Okay. Um, the hard thing is how are you going to monitor yourself so that you really see how often it has? Because we have to have very sophisticated equipment to say how fast does it go and how slow does it go? Because most equipment creates norms or averages. So that's how it misses it. We have to have preciseness. Heart rate variability will show it, sometimes other things, but you have to have that to see how high it goes. Lemon and vinegar, mm. like if you want to do different things in your tongue, while you may have more electricity, whatever has affected that self-regulation part that's the part that has to have some other kind of reset. Now, after people get mm. whatever, then you can get a more stable and you're going to have more parasympathetic electricity. And I would check all the pathways to make sure you don't have any compressions on your vagus nerve. You know, so you check that. It, it's a tough one. That probably wasn't the yeah. answer you were looking for. No, 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 no. That's fine. I actually, uh, me personally, I've had I had a uh, uh, a, a valve replaced, and then I suddenly uh, you know have flutter, 
So I never have had COVID, you know, so. Right. But I mean, the, I don't, you, you may have been exposed to the virus, but you never got sick. Any, anyway, let's yeah. go back just a teeny bit. So with the mitral valve, is it, are you talking about mitral valve? Yes. Yeah. So have they talked to you about your yes. oral health? Like you, you can never have bleeding gums. You got to keep your mouth perfectly clean. Your sinus is clean. So you may want to consider ozone. You should have ozone cleanings hmm. because that joint between you and the replacement, the natural, that seam, that's very susceptible. Hmm. So you've got to keep the bacteria in your mouth and your sinuses because sinuses are full of, I'm going to call it sludge. We got to keep that sludge. <laughs> so ozone and ozone, um, they make super amazing ozone machines for your ear, ear insufflation. Because again, that is kind of when you lay down or lie down in bed, you're going to get that motion going from your mouth to your ear. And so, you know, people are like, why do you put it in your ears? Because it's going to clean out the eustachian tube. So a little funny thing, the eustachian tube, do you know it has two cranial nerves, one on each end, that has to have equal tone to have a canal that is open? It's going to shock you. What two nerves do you think it is? It's the bully and it's the weak one. <laughs> So just think of it. Cranial nerve five has to be equal to vagus so that you can have, and here I have the perfect demonstrating mode. Oh, where did it go? Oh, boogers. <laughs> ah, Lois. Oh, here it is. Here's my station two. Okay. So in order to have it open, you have to have equal tone. So if cranial nerve five is pulling it, you got a little bit of eustachian tube. And if that mm. eustachian tube is too tight, the sludge just gets stuck. So that's just as a personal note. From cranial nerves, gum pockets, like all it. that kind of stuff, find somebody who does ears, gums, and you can use different pace and maintain it beautifully. But you want to... You just want to minimize the burden in that system from an anatomical point of view. Love it. Hmm. Any other questions? Yes, we actually have tons. Can you can you I'm hear fine. me okay? Yeah. Okay. We we are wrapping it up and yet we would love to have you back on again. Sure. Because we probably have double the number of questions. We haven't asked you about neurosequency and integration. We haven't asked you about, uh, you, you know, uh, the restorative breathing methods and uh, all that. So if you don't mind, we would uh, certainly like at part two. But focus, <laughs> focus, because what happens is it's how do you organize cranial nerves for sleep? Does that make sense? How, how do we do, because we talked a lot about whiplash, right? Because that's the core, <clears throat> something around the neck, near drowning, surgery to where they put a tube down your pipe so they alter your breathing. You know what I mean? And so you, those are the big mm -hmm. four that can turn into sleep apnea or sleep disordered breathing um, or, or gut issues, right? Because it's not one thing because it goes through the big map of the whole, the whole human. But yeah, we can talk about what, whatever topics on, on how we can help restore the autonomic nervous system to health and wellness. Okay, that'd be good. Yeah. All right, All right so let's go ahead, let's wrap it up and, uh, and we will definitely reserve some more questions for the next round, but you have been absolutely hugely informative Thank you. you Thank you so, so much welcome. for uh, sharing some of your wealth of knowledge with us. My pleasure. I I'm going to have to hit the books and I'm going to have to hit the books and read up on my cranial nerves. <laughs> you know, just the whole thing is like, cause the eyes, the, the thing is, is in, until, until you know how to examine them, 
then when you start playing with, it's exciting because in neurophysiology, we don't treat a problem. We get this nerve to talk to this nerve. We get this nerve to talk to this nerve. And then we get them all. It's like teaching the woodwinds have to work with the trumpets and, you know, the violins have to play on cue with the cymbals. Because if you're out of sync, it sounds like a disaster. So that's really what we're doing. I'm getting the different parts of a symphony back together. Just review them really quick so that you know, you know, three and four in the midbrain and they move your eyeball. They have nothing to do with sight, <laughs> but they have to do with your eyeball. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Laney. You've been absolutely wonderful. Thank My you. Pleasure. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Anytime. We're here to help. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Kraken Backs podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you follow us on Instagram at Kraken Backs Podcast. Catch new episodes every Monday. See you next time.